delight to be back in Goodlettsville. I got that right? Amen. And what tremendous leadership the Lord has blessed you with. And, <clears throat> amen. I, I, I sincerely mean that. And uh, I, I do love and appreciate the Zunigas and the contribution they've made in my life. It's a two-way street. And, uh, man, I was watching him up here make announcements and all, and I thought, man, he's so smooth. I mean, just, you know, energetic and just smooth and all. And, and then I thought, boy, they got, they got me here in a little bit. And, uh, I mean, I just, but I love you guys also. I want you to know that you and your family and leadership of this church. And certainly thankful for the blessing of God that's upon this congregation. And uh, <clears throat> it's evident, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in my message today. And so, but it's good to be here. Thank you for the honor. I do consider it an honor to stand before God's people. Amen. You are the apple of God's eye. I tell people for you to attack the church is like poking God right in the eye. That's not a good move on your part. I can tell you that right now. Because I found out that God can kind of hit you back if he needs to. Amen. So, amen. God bless you. It's good to see everybody here. Uh, is Jude here? Is my, there he is. Amen. Is Jason back there? All right. He's going to hate me after this one. Amen. I'm glad to have my grandson here today. His oldest uncle, Jason Hogue. Amen. Which is my son-in-law's older, older brother. So, we're delighted they're here and uh, got more California transplants. <laughs> Amen. I look back there and see the Larsons. I almost feel like it's a Stockton reunion right now. Amen. So God bless you. Okay, are y'all ready? Anybody else hungry here today? I got plenty of candy bars. If you get real hungry and you think you're going to faint on me, just let me know. Let me know and I'll share the wealth with you. <clears throat> and if I get hungry here in a little bit, I'll just stop and eat a Snickers candy bar. <clears throat> Amen. You think I'm joking, but I'm not. <clears throat> I was preaching at camp in uh, British Columbia, and I was in jest again talking about how hungry I was and all. And so about, <clears throat> I don't know, I was about halfway through the sermon, the back doors opened up, and one of the preachers come walking down the aisle with a little paper bag. He walked right up to me, and I'm kind of like, you know. He said, here, here's you a cheeseburger. <clears throat> so I paused and ate it. <laughs> Amen. So anyhow. All right. <laughs> let's, uh, let's get into this this morning. <clears throat> and uh, number one, I'm not here to sermonize. Uh, I've got a repertoire of sermons that I could preach, and I know enough about Pentecostals to preach the right thing, causes a certain response. But I am here to obey the Holy Ghost. And uh, so I want to give you what I felt like the Holy Ghost directed me today. And uh, <clears throat> Matthew chapter 16, if you'll stand for the reading of the word of the Lord and honor to God. <clears throat> I'm going to take a familiar text, and uh, and I want to... Go from there, a launching pad, amen. Matthew chapter 16 and verse number 18. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell, everybody say the gates of hell, gates of hell. shall not prevail against it. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It cannot prevail against the church. Amen. So I want to talk to you today about gates. Now, I preached last Sunday at CLC about taking the gates and all that, but I'm going to go a different direction here today. But I do want to talk to you about gates. A better word that I can tell All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be in your house. Thankful for the people of God. Thankful for every guest, every saint, the leadership of this church. And I pray a blessing upon each and every one. Help me today, God, to get in that flow with you. Help me to be obedient to your voice and to your ways. 
Give me wisdom, strength, and grace today. And I take authority in this service now in the name of Jesus. You confirm your word, your word with signs following in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. amen. Turn to the person next to you and say there's gates and you could be seated. <clears throat> a couple, I don't know, it's maybe right at a month now. I was asked to preach the first or Wednesday night of the Western District Camp Meeting. And a couple days before that, the Lord began to drop a word into my spirit. And that word was portal. And so, you know, I, first of all, instead of going to the Greek, I went to Webster's. <laughs> and just, you know, what is portal? What does it mean? And of course, one of the words for portal is a gate. And so that word we're more familiar with in the scripture than we would be portal. So I began to look at it and begin to see some things that were very intriguing to me. And I want to, uh, I want to kind of start here in Matthew by giving you the scenario, the geographical location. <clears throat> it's amazing to me that there were strategic moments that Jesus would make a proclamation and they would tell you where he was at when he made that proclamation. It's not just that they're trying to tell you this is geographically where he was at, but there's something very significant about where he was at. Now, I think this is being streamed, is that correct? And, you know, my son is evangelizing now, been preaching a message about the gates of hell. So I want everybody here to know, I want all the inner world, internet world to know, I got this from him. camp meeting I had to make that disclaimer he said dad I've only got three or four good sermons and you're taking one of them <laughs> but the deal is is when Jesus here at Caesarea Philippi refers and the gates of hell shall not prevail they literally believe that at Caesarea Philippi there was a gate and it was called the gates of hell I found and discovered that in our world, there are 17 gates of hell that people feels like that it exists. People that believe in the underworld, the demonic, they believe that these are places <clears throat> that there is a release from the underworld, the demonic, whatever, into the earth. Now, you can just, I don't know, you know, maybe that's too much Hollywood, I don't know, but I do believe that there's something important about this. Now, <clears throat> the gates of hell in Caesarea Philippi is where they literally believe that there were certain gods that could move from the underworld into the earth, and they had a shrine there, and actually, if I remember correct, like a cave, and it was called the gates of hell. It's amazing to me that Jesus is standing in front of that and he asked the disciples, who do you say I am? Of course, he first started, who do men say that I am? In other words, tell me what other people have told you about me. Of course, their response was, some, some say you're Jeremiah, John the Baptist, Elijah, one of the prophets. And then Jesus said, well, I'm glad for what other people have told you about me. And I think that's where all revelation starts in our lives with someone else's testimony, with someone else telling us their revelation of Jesus Christ. But God never intended for you to go on somebody else's revelation. He next says, but who do you say I am? In other words, thank God for your mom, your dad, your grandma, your grandpa, Bible study teacher, Sunday school teacher, whoever it was that was telling you initially about him but there needs to be a place and a moment in your life that it become a personal revelation to you. I remember pastoring a, a lady there in Oklahoma and she come to me and she said, <clears throat> Brother Morgan, I accept the oneness of God because I think you're honest. And I said, well, I'm glad you feel that way. She said, now I don't see it. But I think that you're honest, and she said, I think you're a truthful man, so I'm going to embrace it and accept it on that merit alone. And I was thankful for that. I was thankful for the fact she had that much confidence in me.
But the deal is, I knew she's got to get this for herself. So I remember she called the house one day and was asking some questions. And it's just one of those moments that, you know, I just quoted a verse of scripture. And when I did, I mean, on the other end of the line was this, oh, my God. Oh, my Lord. And then she goes to talking in tongues. The phone hits the floor. You could hear her doing a stomp dance in there. And uh, I just hung up and said, she'll call back. And sure enough, in a few minutes, she called back. And she said, Brother Morgan, when you quoted that verse, she said, I've seen it. It all makes sense to me right now. That was her Caesarea Philippi moment. She's now identifying with, with Simon Peter. Who do you say I am? And I've always just kind of envisioned old Simon Peter bouncing over there. I got this one, guys. I, I got, I've messed up on a lot of others, but I got this one. Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Now notice what he says, the son of the living God. And they are present at the gates of hell or the gates of the dead or Hades. So you've got a contrast in Revelation, which is always, Revelation always deals in contrast. So now we're talking about death, we're talking about hell, we're talking about Hades, but then here's the contrast of it, the living God. We're not talking about something that's dead. We're not talking about the underworld here, we're talking about a living God. Uh, in your life, I will tell you this, that the same thing happens to you. There's a contrast of Revelation. What do you mean by that? Well. Here's the deal. If God's ultimately going to show you that he's a healer, there has to be a contrast for you to see it. In other words, before you see him as a healer, sickness has to come first. Some people don't see that. They don't realize that. They think that whatever the contrast is, that's the ultimate thing that God's trying to do in their life or the ultimate thing that God's trying to show them. But the fact is, there is a day and there is an evening. Every creative day starts the same way. Now our days start in the morning and go to the evening. God's days are different. He said in the evening and the morning was the first day. So God's days start with an evening experience. It usually starts and there's, I, I, I don't want to get in, I, I, either way. Uh, there's seven creative days and there's also seven creative days in your life. I'll come back sometime in, in Maybe, hopefully, you'll buy me back. And uh, I'll teach on that, about the seven creative days of your life. But the fact is, every creative day starts the same way. It starts with the evening. You'd call it the negative. See, you would have absolutely no understanding or value of light unless darkness had come first. You wouldn't even know what light is if there hadn't been darkness first. God and his divine ability orchestrated this to be that way. You'd never know that he's your Jehovah Jireh until you'd been in a place that you needed something. You'd never know that he's a way maker until you've been trapped and cornered and didn't feel like there was any way out. You'd never know him as true salvation if sin hadn't to come first. So I thank God that whatever it is that you're going through here today, don't think that's the final outcome. Weeping may endure for the night. I'm, I'm waiting on some of you to catch up. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy cometh in the morning. You may be in an evening experience right now, but just hang on because the sun's going to come back up. It's going to shine again, and God is going to show you things that is going to blow your mind. Ooh. Anybody understand what I'm saying right now? anybody live what I'm talking about right now you know you know anyway anyway I, I, I gotta get out of that so the deal is is here he is he's proclaiming this but notice the term and the gates of hell now that's New Testament that's Jesus proclaiming this he's talking about the power of the church personally I believe that the rock that he's talking about is a rock of revelation and upon that revelation, I'm going to build my church. But in the very gates of hell, he is identified as the living God. It's like, it's like God's putting it right in the devil's teeth. <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense or not. It's like he's taking, the, he's taking it right to the gate of hell saying, I'm God. 
you're not God, I'm God. Woo. Uh, you, you know, you talk about how powerful you are. Uh, you know, pastoring in the state of Oklahoma, we had to deal with a lot of spiritualism. I'll just put it that way. And I mean, it was a constant battle and was always, and I mean, man, I was, I was getting frustrated as it seemed like we couldn't get a break and, and uh, just a lot of crazy stuff was going on. And I remember going to my office and kind of having a little pity party and telling God about how hard it was and all the opposition and, and uh, you know, all this spiritualism and stuff that was going on and medicine being practiced against us and all. And I don't know, I just kind of opened my Bible and it fell over there where <coughs> in Simon Peter's epistle where he's given salutations. And his salutations is this, the church which is at Babylon saluteth you and so doth Marcus my son. Well, a salutation meant all is well. So when there was a salutation, you were declaring that all is well. But what caught my attention was, is that term Babylon. So I got to study it out and I found out that old Simon Peter took a little missionary journey into Babylon and built a church in Babylon. Now in the scripture, Babylon represents everything that's evil. There is a mystery Babylon. So when I'm reading this, the Lord kind of like this, this way it comes to me. So you think you're having trouble building a church here. Simon went right to Babylon and built a church. And if I can build a church in Babylon, I can build a church anywhere. Ooh, I'm, I'm getting to my message now. You know, here, here's what I want to tell you. I understand that there's gates. I understand that there's resistance. I understand all of that. I understand that there are literal places in the earth that have become gates of hell. It is a portal. It is a gate to release certain things into the world. We view them as strongholds. Nashville is a portal and a gate. Did I lose you? And you know what? The enemy would make you think, you know what? It's too hard. It's too, you know, it's too much resistance. There's too much this, too much that. But I want to remind you, if God could build a church in Babylon, and if Jesus could go to the very gate of hell and proclaim a victorious church, then I'm here today to tell you, God's not going to have any problem building a church in the gates of hell. I wish I had somebody that believed that right now. We talk so much about the resistance. We talk so much about principalities and powers and all this stuff and all. I think sometimes we get so focused on it that we lose sight of who we serve. And we lose sight that our God reigns. Not the enemy, but our God reigns. Now, don't, don't be deceived because the fact is, and, and I was talking yesterday and I told her, I said, you know, my wife, everything's black and white. There's no gray. Everything's just right, wrong, black, white. And I said, she's got a real problem when she thinks evil is getting by. And I have quoted her that verse of scripture a lot. When I saw the prosperity of the wicked, my foot well and I slipped. That's not talking about the wealth of the wicked. That means it looked like wickedness was getting by and prevailing. And when I seen that, my foot well and I slipped because it looked like it was winning until I went into the house of the Lord and I seen the end thereof. You've got to learn to look past the present and you've got to look to the end of things and understand our God reigns. There's nothing getting by our God. Whew, I don't care if you think all this evil in America's getting by. Why don't God do something? Trust me. Just look to the end of it. I feel like the Lone Ranger up here right now. Hey, Amen. You know, we, we get so mesmerized by the Antichrist and the power of the Antichrist and all the evil's going by. And I mean, you know, America's going to hell in a handbasket. And, and I agree. I mean, it's messed up. We're so confused right now. <laughs> I'd, I'd get into that, but I'm not. Amen. I mean, people are confused. I'm not confused about my gender. I don't know why anybody else is confused about theirs. <laughs> and if we keep, I said this at camp, if we keep adding all these other things, we're going to actually have the whole alphabet covered. <laughs> and it's just, I, I listened to somebody here the other day talk about I'm a two-spirit person. Where 
in the world do they come up with some of this nonsense? But the fact is, this is what's going on. And if we're not careful, we view this as, look at what's going on. It looks like that's winning right now. Well, it doesn't matter what it looks like right now. Somebody asked me, well, I want to be careful. Somebody asked me one time, I said, what, what, what do you want to do about, you know, the gay pride and all that stuff? And I said, I don't have to do anything about it. He said, what do you mean? You don't, I said, nope, I don't pray. I don't, I don't even worry about it. Oh, well, why not? I said, because it's already instructed in the scripture what's going to happen. He said, what do you mean? I said, pride goes before a fall. The very fact that they use the word pride means they've predicted their fall. Mm. So, you know, we're looking at all this stuff right now. We think, man, this stuff's getting by. But I'm going to tell you that God is going to build a church in the gates of hell. And the gates of hell's not going to prevail against it. So it doesn't matter how crazy the world gets. It doesn't matter how much demonic resistance there is. You just rest assured that God is going to have a church and a victorious church and a culture that's contrary. We have to, uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm trying to just really move through this part of it. Uh, we, we have to be careful that we don't say the same thing that the people said to Moses. You know, they go over, check out the promised land, they come back and this is what they said. Our little ones will fall prey. In other words, our little ones cannot live in that culture and survive. And it got them in trouble with God. Because then God says, so you think the little ones, you think your offspring, you think the one's going to have trouble? He said, they're actually the ones that's going to occupy it, but you're not. Because you didn't think that I could keep them safe in a culture and an environment that's contrary to covenant people. And if we're not careful, we'll start saying the same thing. Oh, man, I just don't know how young people are going to live for God. I just don't see, you know, and all this stuff and all. Listen. God's seen all this. He didn't wake up this morning and say, oh, man, what am I going to do? It's really getting bad down there. You know, am I, I'm telling you, God has strategically placed us. See, I had to come to this conclusion about being in California. And everybody has to come to the conclusion that your promised land is filled with giants and adversaries and walled cities. That's your promised land. And when they got ready to take the promised land, all these Canaanites were there. You ought to study the Canaanites that's mentioned there. These are descendants of who was it, Ham or whoever, all this. It was just weird stuff, just weird stuff. Lots of perversion among the Canaanites. And this is the very place that God said, that's your promised land. <laughs> well, what are we going to do about it? Well, go drive it out. But that's your promised land. And so we look sometimes at the promises of God, but we get a little messed up because well there's walled cities there and there's you know uh, if this is your promised land goodlitzville whatever this place is in the metro nashville area this is your promised land but that doesn't mean that there's not canaanites and there's not culture that's in us that's contrary but you are covenant one god people and and, and, and here's the deal i asked god i said what's so special about that 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 little strip of land I had, I had a guy tell me, he was a businessman, and he said, you know, I don't get this deal about Israel. He said, if America's so concerned about Israel, why don't they just give them a bunch of West Texas? And he was serious about it. He said, we got all kinds of land out there, you know, it's kind of similar to what they have. And he said, I mean, it'd be more geographical area and he'd stop all that fighting and nonsense. And I said, but sir, you don't understand. God made a covenant with the seed of Abraham that that belonged to them. But what was so strategic about that little geographical area? And so I, I, that got me. So I get to study it out, and this is what I found. You ready for it? All the major trade routes move through that little area along the Mediterranean Sea. So the whole world would come through Israel. And God said, this is exactly strategically where I'm going to show them one God covenant people we'll put it right there Whew. and I feel to tell you that God's raised this church up and put it right here in this geographical area so that all the cultures of the world can come by and say 
That's why it's. Uh, that's why when they got on the top of Mount Sinai, the first thing that God said to them was, we're going to have to figure out how many gods there is. Because the land that you're going to, they got all kinds of gods. But I want you to go there, and I want you to represent one God, and don't fall to their gods or start practicing what they practice. Because if you do, I'm going to turn on you. And so God never intended for us to get into our promised land and then the culture start changing us and we become like the Canaanites. I'm putting you there so they can see something that's counterculture that doesn't have to fall to the idolatry that's there and can stand upon that revelation that there's one Lord, there's one faith. I, you know, I, 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 I thought maybe you believe that, amen. There's one Lord, there's one faith, there's one baptism. There's one God who is above all, through all, and in you all. God has strategically placed this church right here in your promised land. He said, I know you got some adversaries. I know there's still some giants around, but this is your, this is, who I feel in a whole lot of direction. This is your promised land. Now, when Joshua went in to take it, God said, now here's some spe specific instructions. You know, God told Moses and them, he said, I'll send hornets before you to drive them out. You know, one of the, just recently I discovered when it says Lord of hosts, we always just think that's, everybody okay? Anybody hungry yet? I, I, I'll share a candy bar with you up here. I, I, I've, I've seen that, you know, Lord of hosts, and we always say, well, that's the angelic world. No, host includes the elements Nature, creation, all the way down to the atoms. Ooh. So when God said, I'll send hornets before you, that's another part of God's army. He can use the bug world as a part of his army. He can use rain. He can use the sun. I don't know if I believe that. Well, let me give this one to you. When he's talking about who was Sisera, he said, even the stars and their course fought against you. And the book, Brook Kidron fought against you. So God says, when I go to battle, I don't just have angels. I can use the weather. I can use a hurricane. I can use a tornado. Uh, some of you don't like that one. Amen. I can use all sorts of creation. I'm just going to remind you again, our God reigns. He has all of this host at his disposal. And when we go into the promised land like we're supposed to go, he says, you're not going by yourself. We're in a covenant. But when they got there, Joshua, and this is what God said. He said, I'm not going to give it all to you at one moment. You're going to take it little by little. Because if you don't do it this way, you don't have the manpower, the strength right now to maintain it and to keep it. So I'll give you this. And then after you get this and you get that settled, I'll give you more. It is a principle that God operates in the promised land. I don't give all of it to you. I mean, you, you own it, but you conquer it little by little. You take this geographical area, you subdue this, this city, and then you go to the next one. And then you go to the next one. And then you go to the next one. So you establish, we conquered it here, and then you look around you, and you see another community nearby, and you say, that's next. I'm losing a bunch of you right here. That's next. Well, why do we want to do that for? We conquered this. Well, you don't have it all yet. You just got the portion that God's given you now, and the Holy Ghost is saying to us, it's little by little. The deal is God intends, and I know there's other apostolic churches, and I'm not saying anything that they're not a part, but I'm not preaching there today, I'm preaching here. And the deal is God intends for you to have influence all through the Nashville area, Tennessee, and ultimately the world. All right. Um, Old Mogi, Oklahoma population 17,800. It was a boom town in the 80s with oil and then when the oil collapsed and all, I mean, they boarded up stuff. We got a big refinery they used to, I think it's still there, a refinery that had to shut down. It just 
on the north side of town is just a memory, boarding up stuff downtown. I mean, it was becoming a ghost town. And it was there, <laughs> it was there that I got to preaching that there's going to be a great revival among the Chinese-speaking people. And one of the men in the church, is a good man, he come up to me after service. He said, Brother Morgan, I don't know why you keep preaching about Chinese people. He said, there's none anywhere around here. I said, well, that's true, but there's a few of them in the world. Because all he could see in that church could see is the immediate geographical area. And they felt like this was the end of their promise. This is all that we're worried about. Boy, I got something cornered right now. This is all we're worried about. This is all we're interested in. We've got this. We've conquered this. And this is where we dwell and this is where we stop. But God says, no, that's just the first part of little. Same way with you living for God. You take it little by little, line upon line, precept upon precept. God doesn't give you the whole enchilada in one moment. Well, that sounded good right there, enchilada. Amen. <laughs> I'm going to talk about food every time I preach. Amen. So the deal is, is we take it little by little. Now, here's what happened. You ready for this? Here's what happened. Uh, the lady's in charge of our home Bible studies. She called me. She said, Brother Morgan. She said, I was up at the county jail doing some Bible studies. And she said, there's two Chinese people in the county jail. They got picked up coming through the county and something about immigration and all the stuff and all. And she said, what do you think? I said, well, let's see what we can do to help them. So we raised some money, bailed them out of jail, hired them an attorney. And they started coming to church. The first service they came to church in was, we was in a red hot revival. I mean, it was one of those revivals where you didn't wiggle because if you did, they'd pounce on you and pray you through the Holy Ghost. I mean, everybody was in attack mode. It was like David Smith on steroids, amen. And, and I mean, it was, and so that was their first service. So toward the end of the service, the Holy Ghost moves on me, and I go to speaking in tongues. What I didn't know was I was speaking fluent Mandarin, and I was telling Chen who Jesus was, the plan of salvation. I baptized her that night, and she received the Holy Ghost in the water. Now, God was saying it's little by little. That was my introduction to the Chinese people. Well, I kept preaching there's going to be a great revival among the Chinese people. And so Brother Willoughby heard about it, and they started inviting me to participate in stuff. Now, I've been in and out of China, I don't know how many times, connected deeply with China. But it started in Okmulgee, Oklahoma. See, here's the deal. Paul makes this statement to the, to the church at Corinth. He said, I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost, for there is a great open and effectual door here, but there are many adversaries. You show me a gate, you show me a portal, I'll show you enemies. Because their responsibility is to make sure that whatever is supposed to either enter or leave is not going to come through there. And Paul had all kinds of resistance at Ephesus. I mean, he had the beast of Ephesus. We don't know what all that means. Personally, I think it was a demonic world. I preached about that this week. Some say, no, he was actually in the arena. It doesn't matter, the beast of Ephesus. There was, there was the, the temple of the goddess Diana. The city had been given to curious arts, which means witchcraft and spiritualism. It was strong resistance. But Paul knew it was a portal. Paul knew it was a gate. And he said, I'm staying here until Pentecost. I'm going to make sure that I remain in this position until God opens and we get through that door. Well, if you know the rest of the story, Paul Harvey, then the fact is, is that they did get through the door. And what God wanted to flow from Ephesus began to flow. Because within a two-year period of time, the Bible says from Ephesus, one school of Tyrannus, that all of Asia heard the word of God. Ephesus become a portal. Ephesus become a gate. Oh, Jesus. But the enemy knew what it was. See, here's the thing. Uh, well, you know, the Bible talks about uh, uh, the angels switch things. They, 
look into and all. Well, he didn't say thing, just salvation. The actual subject is, is the prophets prophesying Jesus Christ. So what they looked into was the prophecies in regard to Jesus Christ. So the real subject there is prophecy. Angels look into it. That doesn't just mean good angels. That means the whole angelic world, good and bad. So once something is prophesied or spoken, the angelic world becomes a student of it. It observes it. And while we're sitting there trying to figure out, well, I don't know if I believe it or not. I, maybe he's a false prophet. Maybe you know, he missed it all. While we're doing all that, the angelic world and the spirit world is moving toward it. That's why by the time you finally get there, the enemy is bunkered in. Because he believed what God said. And any time, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get into this right now. Any time there is a prophecy in regard to a church, regard to you, the enemy is going to do everything it can to get there and to resist you and to try to keep you out or keep whatever in. So the deal is we have to... Uh, uh, I preached this years ago, and I, I got to find it. I, I got it somewhere in notes, but, man, I got, I got legal pads, notes stacked. It, 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 it'd be mission impossible almost. Uh, but I, I studied this, and I found it, that one place is in, in the Psalms that talks about uh, praise ye the Lord and all this stuff, praise him, ye heavenly host. It literally means that from creation, God strategically placed over geographical areas, an army of angels that are only activated by the praises of God's people. So before there was a Goodlettsville, God put it in the heavens above it. There'll be a day that my people are gonna come and they're gonna praise me. And when they begin to praise me, you're gonna go into, who? I just need people that understand that I know they're in a place of resistance. I know that they're in a place of, you know, hell resisting them, but I've also positioned some other things. So it all depends on which side you want to look at. You can get so mesmerized by the enemy, but Paul didn't just say there was a door. He said an open effectual door and the word effectual means energized. So God says, here's the door. I'm going to put supernatural energy there so you can focus on one or two things. You can focus on the adversary or you can focus on that energized door. Because if you get to that door, there's energy there for you. I feel like I'm losing you for something. Am I losing you? Everybody still good? Okay, all right, here's the deal. Watch this, watch this. Oh, Joseph or Jacob, whichever one, he's running in fear of his life. And he comes, you know, he deceives his brother. And, he, and his mama said, hey, come here. You better run. And so he takes off and he's going, he's going back the way that Abraham came. So he comes to a place that's called Luz. And the Bible says he happened to light upon a certain place. He took stones of that place. He made, made a pillow with those stones. Well, you read that, and then a little later on, he has this dream. Anybody remember the dream? How many remember the dream? What's the dream called? Jacob's ladder. So he goes to sleep. He dreams about this ladder, and he said the Lord was above it. And he said that angels were ascending and descending. And he wakes up the next day, and he says, surely the presence of the Lord was in this place and I knew it not. Now he's not telling you that he was ignorant to the dream. What he's saying is, is I didn't know that God actually dwelt in this place. It is a place of tremendous significance. For this is none other but the house of God and the gate of heaven. So we see in the scripture there's gates of heaven. We see in the scripture that there's gates of hell gates, portals, angels ascending and descending. Now, I'll come back to that in just a second. Jesus in the New Testament is talking to Nathaniel. And Nathaniel gets to him and he says, I've seen you under the fig tree. And Nathaniel's like, wow, man, that's a pretty good word of knowledge there. And Jesus said, if you think that's something from this day forward, watch him. You'll see the heavens open. And you will see angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. 
What we don't understand is Jesus just proclaimed right there, you are presently looking at the gate of heaven and you're looking at the house of God. It's me. Ooh. Now, why was Luz so special, which ultimately comes Bethel? Because Luz is the place that Abraham built his first altar when he comes into the land of Canaan. The stones that he took to use for a pillow, historians will tell you they were off of Abraham's altar. So because there's an altar in that place, stay with me, because there's an altar in that place, then that means it opens, it opens heaven up. I've been studying this out and I found it to be very true. Most of the times when you read about the throne of God in the scripture, in close proximity is the altar. You ever read that verse of scripture, man's gift maketh room for him, bringeth forth great men? That's not talking about just hang on there, buddy. God's going to finally give you a platform and your ministry and all that. That's not what that means. What it's telling you is, is there's no way you can get into the presence of a king or a great man without bringing him a gift. You've got to bring him a gift. And if the church is going to get to the throne of God, it works the same way. You got to bring him a gift. You can't just get to the throne of God. There has to be a gift that preceded it. Now, if I was teaching this, I'd say, you know what? That's Jesus Christ. Because of Jesus Christ, the ultimate gift of God, we now have boldness to go before the throne of God. But the fact is, is when we're talking about this, we're talking about an altar. So anywhere that there is an altar, what's so important about the altar? Well, you know, I think we've been a little confused about altars, to be honest with you, because we think altars is a place of prayer. Altars is not a place of prayer. Well, I pray, so I got an altar. That don't, that don't mean you got an altar. Altar is a place of death. It's a place of sacrifice. You can pray, but not have an altar. But if you have an altar, you'll pray. The fact is, when I don't have an altar in my life, I'm praying amiss. I'm praying my own will. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now, I used to think I had that interpretation pretty close. And then this past week, I discovered something. That verse that he uses goes back, I think, into Deuteronomy, talking about the Levites. The Levites was a living sacrifice. They were, I don't get into all that. <laughs> They, they serve God, and that's what he's saying. He said, you know, you, you, this, this is a reasonable service. You're serving God as the Levites in the Old Testament. This is your re responsibility. But then he comes down. Is this boring? No. Then he comes down to the next verse. He says, and don't be conformed to this world, but rather be transformed by the renewing of your minds that you might prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Now, I want to help some of you here, Okay. Quit going to people asking them to give you a word. I got some good advice for you. Would you like to hear it? Go get it yourself. Are you that spiritually lazy? People that are always coming, you got a word for me. You know what you're telling me? I have no altar in my life. And I want you to assume the position of God and speak for God. I had, a, I had an old preacher tell me, we was talking about him for church. And he said, I called him talking about him. this guy who's supposed to have been a prophet. And he called me and told me, so you got 30 days to leave Oatmogee. God's going to write Ichabod above the door of that church. Now, I'm telling you, when he told me that, I, I was glad. <laughs> Whew. I'm out of here. Thank God. And, and so I was at church and my wife come to pick me up. Am I just rambling around too much? Seriously. And my wife picked me up and, and she said, what's wrong? You seem a little, I said, well, this guy called and he told me this. And, and she said, well, I'm confused. And I said, why? She said, well, Sunday night you're preaching. I thought you were anointed. And you were talking about what God was going to do and how God was going to move and the revival and all that stuff and all. She said, has God changed his mind since Sunday night? She's the practical one. I said, well, you know. She said, you need to call an elder. So I did. I called an elder. And I told him what happened. This is exactly the conversation. I told him what happened. He said, my God, Mark, are you backslid? <laughs> and I was glad to report to him, not that day. Now, most days, yes, but not that day. And he said, let me ask you a question. 
Why does God always have to put your mail in somebody else's mailbox? You can't hear from God on your own. Now, oh boy, I'm going to mess this whole thing up. In the Old Testament, you needed prophets because they spoke for God. But in the New Testament, prophets are not supposed to be the ones that bring your word from God. You're supposed to have a relationship with God to where God can speak directly to you through the Holy Ghost. And prophets are used to affirm and confirm. I, I, I got people, man. I got people there. I call them prophetic junkies. I had a boy one time, uh, I need to hurry. I had a boy one time come up. I was preaching a conference. I was there three nights, and this boy comes up uh, after service first Sunday. He said, Brother Morgan, he said, God spoke all this to me. And then he told me that you were going to tell me the rest of this in this meeting. I said, oh, okay. So the second night after service, he come up. He said, you got that word from me? I said, no. What do you think? It's just a light switch we flip on and off? No, I don't. Third night he come up, you got that word, it's conference over. I said, nope. Man, he got irritated. He got upset. He said, you're supposed to have a word for me. Well, he pushed the right button. I got a word for you now. And it's coming straight out of the gospel of Mark. <laughs> and I said, you know, son, there's something I can't figure out. He said, what? I said, God spoke all that other stuff and filled in the blanks. He only left two blanks open. If he's telling you all this stuff, why don't he just go ahead and fill in the other blanks? I said, you don't want that. What you want to do is you want to leave here saying, Brother Morgan prophesied over me and gave me a word. And I said, now, this is when I told him. I said, here's my advice. You want a word, I'm going to give you one. Go get it yourself. I am not God. People too lazy to go pray and get the will of God, so they want everybody else. I'm going to tell you, you're living a very dangerous life when you're letting everybody else tell you what the will of God is for your life. But the only way, I'm, I'm, I'm going to start wrapping, the only way that you can find the will of God is what Paul said. You've got to present your body's living sacrifice. You've got to go to the altar. Watch him. You've got to go to the altar. You've got to put yourself and your will on that altar. And then the fire of God's supposed to fall. The fire of God falls at the altar. It's a consuming fire. We start talking about, you know, God, this Holy Ghost and fire. That wasn't a positive thing. John was saying, hey, this, this is about judgment. Our God's a consuming fire. He's going to burn the chaff up. And when you're baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire, fire is the consuming agents of God that's supposed to burn the chaff out of you. So here's my deal. You can burn now or you can burn later but you're going to burn one way or the other. And I'd soon let the Holy Ghost and fire into my life right now and let it consume all that's unrighteous out of my life than to be cast into the eternal lake of fire. All right, all right, all right, all right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to start wrapping it up now. I haven't even ate one candy bar, and I'm going to wrap it up. This is none but the house of God is the gate of heaven. I can only find the will of God by taking myself and my will to the altar and giving it to God. And that's why he said, don't be conformed to this world. Don't conform your life to your own thinking and your own will. But rather, be transformed by the renewing of your minds that you might go prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Now, I don't know what you teach on that, but I have had people try to convince me there's three levels to the will of God. There's the good will of God, acceptable will of God, and the perfect will of God. I was like, what? I didn't know God was schizophrenic. <laughs> I mean, to me, the will of God is it's good, it's acceptable, and it's perfect. That's just the way I've always viewed that scripture. But you will never find that to go prove until you go to the altar. The only way you get to the throne where the word of a king is, is you've got to come by the altar. And when you finally get into the presence of the king, he says, let me think for you. Yeah. Kings don't take public opinion polls. We only do that in America. 
Kings just tell you this is what you're going to do. Where the word of a king is, there's power. Read the next part of that verse. And who can question it? In other words, you would never dare to ask a king, why are you doing that? Now, we do. The biggest battles that we have is when God's operating his kingdom, but it's not fitting into our ideal about the kingdom. I'm just being honest with you here today. You know, when John the Baptist on the banks of Jordan said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And now he's in prison. He's the one that said, I must decrease, he must increase. Now he's in prison. See, it wasn't going the way he thought it was going to go. He thought he understood what that statement meant. Decrease means I'm going to get bumped down and G's going to take the top position, but I'm still going to be high ranking. But now he's in prison about to get his head cut off and he sends a word to his cousin, Jesus. Are you here or do we look for another? Well, I don't know, John. You're the one proudly and boldly proclaiming him to be the Lamb of God. What changed? Well, what changed is, is I thought I understood the kingdom, but I didn't. And Jesus said, you go tell my cousin, the blind see, the lame walk, dumb talk, and blessed is he that's not offended in me. I read a translation of that years ago, and I've never forgotten it. You go tell John to let me run my business the way I want to run it. And see, a lot of us, when we get something from God, we think we got it figured out. And then we, we conform everything to our thinking. But he said, don't, don't conform to this. We're talking about a transformation. And the only way you can get a transformation is for, oh, man, is for God to renew your mind. The word renew there means better. Is this making sense to anybody here? It means better. So God has to take your thinking, change it around, put his thinking into you, which is his will. But the only way you can get there is you can't be self-willed. And the hardest prayer that Jesus prayed and the hardest prayer you will pray is this one. Nonetheless, not my will, but your will be done. That's why in the, when Jesus gives them the discourse on the Lord's Prayer, he starts it right there. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. How does God's kingdom come? By me doing the will of God in the earth, even as it's did in heaven. Now you see that transpiring and you see that taking place. Uh, here we are. You see it happening at Jacob's ladder. You see spiritual alignment. The altar brought them into spiritual alignment. So where there's an altar and there's spiritual alignment, whatever resistance is in the heavens, because if you study Ezekiel and all, I, I'm giving you too much. If you study Ezekiel and all of them, there's a floor of heaven and it's a ceiling to us. But when there's an open heaven, that means that's removed. And there's access coming from the throne of God into the earth realm. Amen. Now, if we believe the gates of hell, it's directly opposite. It's coming from the other world. But when we're talking about the gate of God and the house of God, we're talking about this open heaven. I was sent here today to ask this church a question. Do you want to live under that open heaven? And do you want to be the house of God? And do you want to be the gate of heaven? Meaning that whatever is moving from that world into this world, you have a portal right here. You have a portal here because we built you an altar and we have decided to let the throne of God tell us how to run the business and we're not trying to run it from down here. Yeah. You go ahead and run your life and your ministry and everything the way you think. Here's one thing you'll never have. Angels ascending and descending. You're kind of on your own. You got it figured out? You want to live it your way, Burger King? Go ahead. Go ahead. If you do my will, I'll send angels to help you. You want to do it yourself? That's why the Bible says that the way of a transgressor is hard. Because a transgressor decided not to do it God's way, I'm going to do it my own way. And by that, that's, that's, that's a recipe for disaster right there. Whew. I would rather submit. 
align myself to the throne of God, allow God's throne to tell me how to run my life. And on that, I have angels ascending and descending because I'm going to tell you, that's a part of God's army. And it's a part of the ministry. Boy, I've messed up some of you right here. Boy, you're talking a lot about angels. Yeah, the Bible does too in case you didn't read it. You know, I just tell you this. I, Pentecostal people intrigue me. Some of our ideas and concepts, I hate to tell you, they're, they're so anti-Bible. You know, I, I use this illustration at camp, and I said, if I start talking about, how old are you, son? 27. 27. Have you ever had a demon visit you or come around you? Yeah. Yeah, most people have, so that's not a trick question, you know. I, I, if I start talking about how many of you have ever a dark figure come in your room was choking you and or you was playing with a Ouija board before your mom knew what you were doing and almost killed you. <laughs> all this stuff. If I start talking about the, 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 the demonic world and all this stuff and all, a lot of people here say, oh, yeah, man, I, I, I felt them around. I had one show up one time in my truck. So why is it that you'll believe that? But when I start talking about angels and angels visiting you, you're like, hmm. You're kind of like, oh, Hezekiah, when the prophet went to him and said, set your house in order, you're going to die. And oh, Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall and said, please, God, don't let me die. Extend my life. God told the prophet, go back in there and tell him, which was a mistake. And he paid for it. But he said, go back in there and tell him I'm going to give him 15 more years. And when the prophet went back in there, pastor, he told him, he said, God's going to extend your life, give you 15 more years. And Hezekiah said, I need a sign. Well, you didn't need a sign when you were told you was going to die. But now that you're told you're going to live, I need a sign. Why is it that we're more prone to believe in the gates of hell than we are the gates of heaven? God's intent for this church is to be a portal and a gate of heaven that flows from his throne like a river. And it flows out of this building and it flows through this entire metro area and you start taking it little by little. Here, conquered it. There, conquered it. And it just keeps expanding, which means that all the resources of God. <clears throat> Can I tell you one more thing? Uh, I, I was uh, driving around San Francisco one day. Sister Morgan and I, when we first got there, we'd drive over what's called St. Francis Woods. Man, there's nice homes over there. I mean, they're, they're multi-million dollar homes over there. And we'd drive over there, drive around the neighborhood proclaiming, we claim one of these houses in Jesus' name. <laughs> and uh, so one day I kind of got back up in there and I really kind of didn't know where I was at. And I, I come across this house that had this fence around it and I could tell there's guys outside walking around it. I mean, you know, it, it, you know, they're packing. I can say that here, can I? They're, they're, they're packing. And so I, I, I was intrigued. I said, what in the world? So I pulled up and looked over on that fence, and I seen this little plaque. They had an inscription, and it says, this property belongs to the People's Republic of China. I'm like, but I'm in San Francisco. That belongs to us. What I didn't know is I'd found the home of the ambassador. Wherever an ambassador's house is or an embassy, that geographical area it sets on does not belong to the nation it's in. It belongs to the nation it represents. That's why to attack an embassy somebody needs to remind them to attack an embassy is an open declaration of war it's as though they come to invade U.S. soil because wherever America has an embassy that is U.S. soil Whew. and so God has put the church in the earth like an embassy and says, I know I know where you're at but wherever that is that's an embassy and if it's an embassy that makes you ambassadors that got me. That got me. 
So I started studying ambassadors. And this is what I found about ambassadors. You ready for it? An ambassador can never represent his own personal views. He can only tell you the views of the kingdom he represents. So when he's standing there, he can't tell you this is what I think. He's got to tell you directly what the president or his government or whatever he comes from. He's got to tell you exactly what they think. The second thing is he doesn't sit there and worry about resources. Because all the wealth of the nation he represents is behind him. And he doesn't have to worry about soldiers because all the armies of the nation he represents is behind him. Unless you're in America. Some of you will figure all this out here in just a second. When they attacked our embassy and we didn't even try to protect them or defend them. Which was a disgrace. I'm telling you it was a disgrace. So the fact is, is if you're an ambassador and you're... You're there representing him. That's what the kingdom is. The kingdom is like the embassy in the earth. We don't rule the whole earth now. That would come during the millennial reign. But the fact is this church right now is an embassy in this area. And you represent the kingdom of God. And every one of you are ambassadors. And it's your responsibility to go out there and represent the views of your kings it's not by private interpretation. God could care less of how you think. When you speak for him and the king, you better make sure you're saying exactly what he told you to say. Nothing more, nothing less. And then we don't have to worry about the army behind us because I've already said we got a whole host of things that's fighting for us. And we don't have to worry about the resources because God says, quit worrying about the resources. My resource is not tied to the economy and inflation and Dow Jones and stock market. I created all the gold and the silver. And if you ever start running short, all I got to do is say, let there be gold bricks. And so we get worried about how we're going to do this. How are we going to take it? How are we going to take this area? I'm telling you, in the Holy Ghost, I know. How are we going to take this area? Well, you're going to take it little by little. You're going to send ambassadors out there. They're going to represent the view of the kingdom. But how are we going to finance it? I found this out about God. You start doing his will. He'll make sure all the resources you need are there. The church does not need to pray for more power. It needs to pray to find the purpose of God. Because God only allocates his power to fulfill his purpose. People that are praying for more power, as far as I'm concerned, you're an egotistical maniac and you're on your way to self-destruction. Why would God give you power if you don't even know what it's for? You just want power. Power and the craving of power comes out of your human nature. When we find people in the church that are craving power and they want power in the church, they're dangerous people because it comes out of self-will and it comes out of the human nature. I'll tell you one more thing and I'm done. God, God taught me a lesson. Uh, long story short, there's a teacher that the girls had and, and her husband, both of them had her in the fifth grade, fourth, fifth grade. And uh, her husband got diagnosed with cancer and uh, he... Uh, we pray for him and become friends of the family. We pray for him and all. I wish to give you a testimony that God healed him, but he didn't. And uh, so, I don't know, a few weeks went by after the funeral, and I was picking the girls up, and Miss Clark, the teacher, come out and said, Pastor, I want to give you this letter. My daughter wrote this letter to the family, but I feel very impressed to share it with you. So she gave the letter. So we was on our way home, and I asked my wife to read that letter. So she started reading the letter. It's addressed to the family. Thank you for, you know, was standing with us and all this stuff. But then this statement, when my dad was first diagnosed with cancer, I went to pray. And in prayer, the Lord asked me, why is it that you only ask to see my power, but never my purpose? I said, read that one more time. So she read it again. So I went home, it's for the days of the computer, got my old strong concordance out, went run reference. And I found out that in the New Testament, the word power never stands alone. It's always associated with a purpose. You don't need his power unless you're doing his purpose. But once you find his purpose, you don't have to worry about the power to do it. I, I, I'm kind of meddling here a little bit. We had a lady that worked in our nursery and uh, she cirrhosis of the liver. She's in the, I mean, they're going to pull the plugs and I mean, she's technically dead. So her brother attended our church. So he come up after service and said, Brother Morgan, he said, uh, 
uh, you know, they're going to they're going to turn off the machines first thing in the morning, and, and I just let you know. And I mean, t technically, she's dead. So I'm standing there, and the Holy Ghost said, "You tell him she's not going to die; she's going to live." But if they give credit to their medicine, I will take her. So I told Sonny, I said, Sonny, I said, and he, he, his last name was Sonny Johnson, and his family was the tribal leaders of the Creek Nation, the who's who among the Creek Nation, Indians, Native Americans. So I told him, I told him what happened. I said, now, Sonny, you go on up there to the hospital, and you tell them, gather them in the waiting room, and you tell them I'm on my way up there, and I got something to tell them. I said, she's going to live. So he went ahead of me. I turned to our assistant pastor, which is named Terry Harmon, pastor's court in Mississippi now. I said, Terry, I want you to go with me. So I told him what happened. He said, oh, yeah, you know. So we get up there, and when I walk into the waiting room, needless to say, it's not the most popular person in the room. Because I told them, this has nothing to do with your medicine. This has everything to do for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So I went inside there. I walked over there. I had a little ball of oil, and I just kind of smeared a little on the forehead. And I stretched my hand out, and I said, Phyllis, God said you'll live and not die. I said, I speak life into you right now in Jesus' name. I turned around. I said, all right, let's go. So we walk out in the hallway, and Terry, I could tell, he's like, I said, what's wrong? He said, that's it. I said, what do you mean is that it? He said, that's it? That's all there is to happen in there? I said, well, what did you expect? Me jerk her up out of the bed? Oh, I know us Pentecostals, we're waiting for that emotional rush. Ah! Why do I need all that when God's already told me what he's going to do? Oh, boy, that went over real well. Us Pentecost, boy, when it, it hits us, and we get the goosebumps going. We get all inspired. Oh, I believe God can do it right now. What God tells you don't have anything to do with your emotions. You better learn to separate your emotions from what God told you to do because your emotions will lie. So we, I told him, I said, you know, God, it's done. So we get in the car, we drive home. Next morning, 7 something in the morning, Sonny calls me and said, I don't know why we do this. Hey, Brother Morgan, you're not going to believe what just happened. Well, try me. He said, man, Phyllis come to a while ago. They got her right now running tests. He said, a miracle. I said, well, Sonny, God said she'll live and not die. Now, brother, pastor, once I get that word from God, I don't have to question it. I don't have to worry about it because I know what the purpose of God is, and I know when I'm operating in the purpose of God, he's going to allocate everything I need and whatever resources I need, spiritual, physical, he's going to allocate those to meet the need of that to fulfill his purpose. And God is beginning to stretch this church and talking to you about taking it little by little. But the promise of God is, I'm going to be behind this, I'm going to protect you, and this is how you will take this area. See, we think it's just about building this building and filling it up. And God said, that's not what I'm interested in. I'm interested in you invading this area. I need you to go out just like they did, two by two, and I want you to go cast out devils, heal the sick, and raise the dead. Now, I'm, talk well, I'm about to get mad. I can really preach good when I'm mad. I'm talking to you Pentecostals here today. See, you love church. You love coming together. You love gathering together. You love to be entertained. You love to sit there like the judgment of the gladiators. What are you going to do for me today? How are you going to minister to me today? I tell you, I'm going to minister to you. I'm going to minister to you like this, and you're not going to like it. Get up off your lazy and get out there and do what God called you to do. Sorry, that offended you. This is what God's asking this church. You, you prove you can congregate. You prove that you can build a building. You prove that you've got a great ability to assemble, which is a vital part of the church. But as I preach this week, I'm not talking about the church. Now I'm talking about the kingdom. The church and the kingdom are kind of two different unique things. The kingdom is to advance. You have communities and you have a metro area that God is calling you to. And he's saying to this church right now, Take it little by little. Send them and take it. I'm talking to people right now that are future missionaries. You are future. Uh, I don't mean you're going to go overseas. I'm talking about missionaries right here in the area. Boy, it's locking up in here right now. Some of you got mad at me because I tried to afflict you out of your comfort. 
I'm not here to comfort you in that area. I'm here to challenge you right now. And I'm here as a prophet telling you what I feel the Holy Ghost wanted me to tell you. This church is a portal and it's a gate. You'll have supernatural visitations of angels. You'll have supernatural provisions that come. But God said, I'm not going to do that because you're doing your own thing. I'm going to do that when you do my will and my thing. And so if we're really... I think I told this at the camp meeting. I was asked to come to the end of Asia, and we had a big uh, meet all the Asian missionaries. 18 missionary families responsible for reaching two-thirds of the world's population. So I'm there, you know, we want to come challenge us and speak faith and vision, all this stuff. I did my first session, and I left so defeated. I was overwhelmed by it. So I get up to my room, and I'm, uh, I'm praying. And I spent quite a time in prayer. Finally felt it lift. I went over to open my curtains. I was way up, you know, 20-something floors up, whatever, and I opened it up. You couldn't see the end of Bangkok. It was just, there it was. And I'm looking out over it, and the Holy Ghost said, I'll tell you the difference between the Book of Acts church and the North American church. The North American church is about gathering and containing. You are more interested into the crowd you'll preach to on a Sunday than you are in sending missionaries into the world. And if you really want to evangelize, you really want to take it, you'll quit worrying about the crowd that you're preaching to and you'll send them out the way they need to be sent out. Now, either we're serious about doing this or we're not serious about doing this. But I tell you, I got some resistance right now. I'm telling you in the spirit, I got some resistance right now. The enemy doesn't want this to catch in this church because if it catches, you will turn this place area upside down and you will have people that come back from their journey and they'll come back and testify I'm prophesying to you to happen they'll come back and prophesy or they'll come back and testify to you about seeing the lame walk the blind see the dumb talk they'll come back testifying about demonic people being delivered. They'll come back and talk to you about praying people through the baptism of the Holy Ghost in places of business and schools and neighborhoods. They'll come tell you about what God's doing in other people's homes. That is the will of God. And if you can get to that place and take, see, here's where we're at right now. Are we going to keep our will, how this revival is supposed to happen here in Goodlettsville? Are we going to take that, put it on the altar and let God burn whatever he needs to burn? And then when he's done, he said, I'm going to establish my way of thinking. You a believer? You a believer? Yes, sir. Got the Holy Ghost? Yes, sir. Baptized in Jesus' name? Yes, sir. You're a believer? Yes, sir. Are there signs following you? I know I got you up here and you're embarrassed right now. And I'm not trying to pick on you. I'm trying to make a point. But Jesus said, these signs shall follow them that believe. It's not about dragging them down to the church and having him cast the devil or him pray the prayer of faith, or the elders praying the prayer of faith. Like I said at camp, dear God, by the time the elders get gathered together, you're dead. I'd rather take Tylenol and wait for the elders to get together. Tylenol works a lot faster. Amen. But I will, what's your name, buddy? Rashan. Rashan? Rashan. Rashan. Did I say it right? It is the will of God. For you, come to church, be nurtured, be strengthened, be taught, be discipled. But it's also the will of God for you to go right out there and for you to lay hands on the sick and them recover. For you to cast out devils. For you to see them speak with new tongues. That is the will of God for your life. Now, what we don't want is you learning about church just to be a consumer. You just come to church and you consume. We're not going to take anything that away. But when you go out there and you start operating the way that you ought to operate, whoo, boy, y'all are looking at me really funny. I'm not interested in that. I just want to come to church. Well, keep keep coming. It's good for you. All right, I've killed this whole service, and you're all mad now, and, and, uh, you know, you don't ever have to invite me back. But I will go back and say, okay, I said what I was supposed to say, and I challenged the way I'm supposed to challenge them. 
you can't even begin to fathom the harvest that God wants to give this church. I'm talking about thousands of people around this area. I want you to listen to me. Thousands of people in small groups. Thousands of people meeting in homes. It's book of Acts. We believe Acts 2.38. Let's believe all of it then. They went from house to house. That's the will of God. It's the will of God for you to turn your house into a mini church. It's the will of God for you to turn your neighborhood into your vineyard and into your harvest field. It's the will of God for you to gather people and teach them and train them. Then when all of a sudden, well, how are we going to see churches number into the thousands? This is how we're going to see it happen. And then when you assemble together, you may have to rent a building big enough to bring everybody together. Boy, I've really lost you. We got a pretty good sized building. This building is not near going to contain what God's going to give you. You may have to once a quarter just everybody come together and say, well, what's the biggest building around here that seat thousands of people? Now, you're really looking at me like I fell out of a tree onto my head. I'm talking to you about things I know God has spoke to me and God is revealing to me. This is how you will take your metro areas little by little, planting them, letting them go do what I've called them to do. If we get busy doing this, we won't have near as much critiquing in the church service. I know I've, I've really just butchered this whole thing up. Hungry people don't care who's cooking. Now, if you've been junk fooding all week and you come to the house of God, you're pretty finicky. I don't like that. I wish you'd preach something different. You preached that last year. You ever, ate with, you ever been with somebody that's hungry, not hungry and they're sitting down there with, you know, they got, a, they got their, you know, potatoes, mashed potatoes. They got gravy on it. And they got their peas over in the gravy like ducks on the pond. And they're just playing around with it. That's not how a hungry man does, but that's how we do. We come to church, get really picky and finicky and just, if we get to doing what God wants us to do, when we gather together, there'll be such a hunger for the word of God and for edification. Whoo. Okay. I've told you what the Lord wanted me to say, so it's yours. This is supposed to be a gate church. This is supposed to be a portal church. God's calling you to do it. He'll hell out his resources and everything to flow through here. But you've got to align yourself with it and accept the will of God and move toward that. All right, let's stand. Amen. Well, this one's ending different. Most of them do. You know, I, I would ask you for an emotional response, but I just think the Holy Ghost is saying, I want you to think. I want you to accept the challenge. I want you to accept the challenge. I want, I want you to hear this. I want you to align yourself to this. Now, you don't have to. You can keep going down the way you're going, keep doing whatever you're doing. But if you really want to be used of God, you really want to explore what I'm talking about today, then it's going to take submission. I've got to submit to the will of God. You want power to resist the devil? You have to submit first. If we submit to the will of God, he'll give us power over all the demonic activity anywhere near us. All right, let's pray. Everybody lift your voice and let's pray. And it's late and I just want you to pray in the Holy Ghost here a second. Would you do that? You have the Holy Ghost. I want you to lift your voice. You claim to be a Christian. I want you to lift your voice. Come on, lift your voice. And I want you to say exactly what Mary said to God, be it unto me, but according to thy word. Let this church rise up today and say, be it unto us as according to thy word. We want to do the will of God. I mean, cry that out to God right now. Not just about this church, but for your own life. Lord, forgive me for being self-will. Forgive me for living my life the way that I wanted to live it. I want to submit and to surrender to your will. And I want you to be the king and the Lord of my life. And I want to live my life according to your will. Come on, talk to the Lord. I mean, cry out to God here a little bit.
Why don't you let the tone of your voice depict the hunger of your soul right now? I'm hungry to do the will of God. I'm desirous to do the will of God. I want to be a true apostolic book of Acts Christian and saint. I'm hungry to do the will of God. Help me to do the will of God, Father. In the name of Jesus.